Today, Stroud is recognised for its blend of artistic, new age and protest culture. It is held by many as the home of Extinction Rebellion. It also bore witness to hundreds of local people turning out for the Black Lives Matter protest in June, um, despite Stroud being just below the western escarpment of the Cotswolds. Just look up your black British civil history. However, for most of its history, Stroud's cultural and industrial development has been tied to textiles. In the Middle Ages, high-quality wool from locally reared Cotswold sheep was a key export, but with the dissolution of the monasteries in the 16th century and the redistribution of land and the burgeoning developments of the Industrial Revolution, the town saw cloth mills springing up along its streams and rivers. Clear water and ready availability of Fuller's Earth made the area's steep valleys well suited to high quality woolen products, but also poorly maintained roads. For many years, this unique combination meant that Strauss Clothiers would produce high quality textiles, but also face logistical difficulties in expanding their production. However, the undeniable quality of Stroud water scarlet and Yuli blue broadcloths meant they were soon traded in the colonies and on the frontiers of the British Empire. With financial support provided in part by the East India Trading Company, Use links to the transatlantic slave trade are well documented, as well as the many atrocities and, and, and exploitations of in, in India, um, or in the area we now see as India, Bangladesh, uh, and Pakistan. As techniques of industrial production improved at home, and the market showed little signs of slowing, it became clear to the wealthy proprietors of Stroud's mills that they would have to expand. And by the 1780s, Stroud began to saw its industrial peak, with the opening of both the Stroudwater and Thames and Severn canal networks. These provided a link to the Midlands, as well as to the cities of Bristol and London. For the next 50 years, and with the continued support of the East India Company, Stroud was able to compete with the growing industry of the North, and much of the period's developments are still visible to this day. However, the arrival of the railways in the 1840s meant hemorrhaging profits for the canals. Trains bringing in coal, red brick and Welsh slate saw the areas, towns and villages facing redevelopment once again. And by the end of the 19th century, most clothiers were facing the barrel of terminal decline. Just over half a century later, the same train lines that spelled the end of Stroud's internationally famed cloth industry were also closed. So we can still see these 17th century mills, the 18th century canals and the Victorian factories and terraces around Stroud. In fact, we celebrate them. But the colonially rooted economic activity which allowed for these developments is obscured by a narrative of empire which we have been told for so long. Uh, this narrative has created an active ignorance that allows us to idolise and aestheticise a history that is actually so so often built upon violence. We don't see the connections between things like our canal systems to that violence. Without the docks and the statues of slave traders, there's often little in the physical environment and around our towns and villages that will instantly make us think, that will provoke a conversation around empire, the slave trade, and the continuations of this kind of economic model that's still with us today. Much has been made in the last few weeks of Stroud District Council securing funding to finish restoring the local canal system. But this doesn't come with a discussion of our area's linkages to the East India Company and the atrocities and exploitations carried out by those clothed in Stroud Scarlet, which allowed us the canals in the first place. Unlike most areas, however, Stroud has an almost totally unique physical link that explicitly ties us to the slave trade in the grade two listed memorial and arch to the abolition of the slave trade, one that ostensibly provides a direct contrast to the likes of Edward Colston. And, and nationally, for so long, this was the only memorial to the end of the slave trade. Now that makes it incredibly unique. I mean, the arch itself was built by um, Henry Wyatt, who was a, a local kind of clothier and, and, and banker, um, and member of the Stroud's Anti-Slavery Society. And it was built in uh, 1834, so the year after the abolition of the slave trade. So in the wake of the Black Lives Matter process and the toppling of the of the Colson statue, um, which you can see a photo of behind me, there was a lot of media interest in the arch um, because it presented the seemingly different narrative, the seemingly something that we can be that we can be proud of. Um, and this language was very explicit in the media coverage. This flew against what our article, uh, Stroud, Slavery and the Misremembering of William Wilberforce, was about, however. Rather than seeing Colston and Henry Wyatt, the man who commissioned the construction of the arch as two opposing forces, we rather see them as two sides to the same coin. This is how we come on to William Wilberforce, who is remembered nationally as a pious parliamentary spokesman for the 
British abolitionist movement. And to quote Carla uh, in his book Natives, he is the patron saint of black emancipation. Now, it is true that the efforts of abolitionists were really, they were essential in ending the practice of chattel slavery. However, what happens when we remember Wilberforce and then remember this anti-slavery arch in this way, in this way of pride and celebration, it, it does two things. Um, so first of all, it obscures the darkest part of our colonial history and the practices is of the slave trade by allowing us to think, well, we ended it first. It was the, it was the sign of the times and we ended it first. And this, this gives us that kind of moral cognitive distance that allows us to separate from the, the brutality of, of centuries of the slave trade. This centralises a white actor and marginalises and ignores the significant impact of black people and their agency in ending the practice for themselves. For instance, black British abolitionists living and campaigning in England at the time, such as Alawada Equiano, uh, Toussaint Louverture, the Haitian who led the first successful slave revolt since Spartacus. Um, or Solitude, a woman who was executed by French forces for her role in leading was pregnant a maroon revolt in Guadeloupe. All these narratives are, are obscured by the kind of the holding up of, of, of Wilberforce. Even the strikes in 1862 by ordinary British mill workers in Manchester in an act of solidarity with the slaves who picked the cotton they weaved. All these people were outshone by the legend of Wilberforce, all these being people who quite frankly risked more and sacrificed more for the cause of emancipation. It also obscures the fact, the second thing it obscures, the fact that abolition did not fundamentally change the economic practices of empire, and nor did it abolish the power structure of this empire, this colonialism, this, this slavery was built upon, that, that power structure being racism, because um, what racism is, it is a power structure. So unless we cast a sharper, more critical eye over these narratives of social justice, then we will just continue to fail to truly understand and honestly critique our history and culture. Um, and this is as true in a national sense, but it's also really true and really important on a local sense. We have to localise these narratives. So this is what we sought to do in Stroud. And so we used the anti-slavery arch as this physical object, kind of just very randomly placed seemingly in the middle of, of um, the Pagan Hill Estates, like five minutes from where I grew up. Um, and I walked past it every day on my way to school. Like there's a school named after Archway. And so we used this anti-slavery arch as a focal point for, for these discussions because we wanted to see what the connections to our area and what connections to the slave trade um, really were. Uh, and we can see these in more detail through the UCL data posts, which um, recorded slave owners and who received compensation for their loss of property um, upon the abolition of slavery in 1833. The, the basic fact here being that like, the British state paid about 40% of GDP to slave owners um, as, as compensation, um, which is obviously a huge chunk. Um, we only stopped paying the interest of this chunk of money. Um, we stopped paying that in 2015. In Stroud, these include Samuel Baker of Lippiat Park, who owned 410 slaves in Jamaica and was paid £7,990, a vast sum of money for the time. Parts of this money were being invested into local infrastructure, such as Baker's Wharf in Gloucester Keys. We can see, therefore, that nothing fundamentally changed after the abolition of the slave trade. Um, and we can see that in the meaning of the word abolition. Like abolition is meant to mean the fundamental change of a system of practice and an institution. Um, whereas the, the system of economic exploitation along racial lines has never been abolished. We still live within a global system of racial capitalism today. Now this argument is, is what we set out in, in our original article. That we, can't, we can't use something like the arch to feel pride about our local, our local areas kind of um, connections to the slave trade because that was that was all we will end up remembering. But it's not the narrative, as I said already, it's not the narrative that we were met with. It's not the narrative that we were met with in, in the media interviews and it's not the narrative that we saw publicly coming out from our article. This is something we expected. Indeed, it was something we set to, out to challenge in our initial article. To bring these discussions of terms like racial capitalism, like abolition, like reparations and decolonization into local discussions is not an easy or typical thing. But it has started. And we've seen that in the, in the extent of conversations that, that, that grew out of the Australia Against Racism group, the media coverage that, that we ourselves helped generate of the Black Lives Matter process in Stroud, which had hundreds of people attending. But in using the physical linkages that we have to the slave trade, um, like the arch, to frame the discussions of our area's broader linkages to slavery, to empire, to colonial exploitation, to challenge the prevailing narratives, like the pride that we want to feel in, in the abolition of, of, of slavery. For the vast majority of people who were enslaved, 
um, their social and economic conditions barely changed at all. Um, whereas all the money that went, went went to the people who owned them. This is why considering the full histories of our local built environment is important. This was a period of history the entire country benefited from economically. Those linkages will be there. We can see them and understand them through analysing the towns and villages that so many of us live in. Using something like the anti-slavery arch is such a powerful way to bring these discussions into the local narratives. Um, and we can really see the discussion, the success of that in the seeds of, of change that I think we can see. We will see things every day which will have linkages to, to some form of, of, of racism, of colonialism, of empire. Um, and then through that we can really start to see how, how fundamental it is. Like, this isn't something we can ever, we can never be a post-racial society when we have buildings and streets named after to slave owners, for example. We can certainly never be a post-racial society when people are okay with that. Um, yeah, so it's through seeing this and seeing these and, and understanding them and analysing them um, and understanding the towns and villages that so many of us live in, um, that is where real, well that is one avenue where real positive change can, can come about.